Hey, so let's jump in here and get going real quick this morning. We're in this series called Side by Side. Today, the series is, the, the, the title is this, Side by Side, No Worries. First question out of the box, does anybody here worry? Let's see your hands up high. Anybody worry? Okay, how many of you are liars? Let's see your hands. Just kidding. How many of you would say, I'm not a worrier, but I do experience anxiety? Let's see your hands. No anxiety. Okay, yeah, all right. So um, I think that's, that pretty much catches us all. But that's what we're going to be talking about today because uh, we're just going to kind of pick up where we left off last week in, in Luke 12. But um, in this series, Jesus would have never imagined a Christian doing life all by themselves or a marriage doing a marriage all by themselves. So we, he would always imagine, hey, when we study the scriptures, Jesus would be like, there's, there's always going to be this group of people because um, it was important in those days. They didn't have all these different um, tools that we have today where we can do things independently. So it was important that, that, that we come together. And that's a biblical thing. So we talk about life groups. We talk about other things. We talk about the importance of being here on Sunday. And all those things are important. But getting together... And doing life ultimately side by side is ultimate important. Now, some of the things we talked about a few weeks ago, we talked about making sure that our relationship with God is on firm firm foundation and it's solid. In other words, meaning that our relationship with God is based solely on what Jesus has done for us by grace through faith. Not anything I can do in my own, right? Amen? We also talked about last week really taking a look at our relationship to money. In other words, not letting money take control of us. So we asked some tough questions like, is money ruling over me or am I ruling over it? Is my money aimed toward the things that God says matters most? And what does God say matters most? We looked at this last week. Remember, he was asked... Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So number one is his name. That's the greatest thing, his name. And he said, okay, then the second was like the first, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So ultimately, what God says matters most is his name and his people, taking care of people. In other words, pointing to the eternal while taking care of the temporary. And we said this, however... Your life is currently aligned. In other words, the way you spend your time and money and resources reveals what is in fact most important to you. So, if you were brave this past week, what you might have done is audited your time and money and taken an honest look at them. And then the follow-up question would be this. Does that, in other words, the thing you value most, align with what God says matters most? So living side by side, it's big enough hurdles, but we'll, again, talk, talking about worry and stress and, and anxiety today, let's be honest, that is so difficult. How hard is it to do life with someone side by side if they're continually worried? I mean, it becomes hard. Do you really want to spend time with that person who's just stressed out, anxiety, worried all the time? You're like, I'm going the other direction. And the phone rings and you see the number and you're like... I don't know. I love them. But anyway, can I ask you a question? What do you worry about today? I know something just popped into your minds, and I could probably guess what it was. In other words, you say, what are you saying? What consumes a huge amount of your mental energy? What creates anxiety in you? What do you find yourself thinking about in the middle of, night, in the middle of the night when you can't sleep? What is it that keeps you from focusing on the most important things? What is it that gets the majority of your mental strength? We're a nation, folks, of warriors. We worry so much. I checked the polls, and guess what? The number one thing people in America worry about is money. Money. Really, three out of the top five things that were listed were related to money. And then the other two were about our physical well-being. So the two things that we're most anxious about are our money and our health. And I think that's always been true of people, probably from the beginning of time. 
So we're going to kind of pick up right where we left off last week. Jesus was teaching about this important eternal stuff, and this guy interrupts him right in the middle of this important message, and he's like, hey, Jesus, can you go tell my brother he needs to divide the inheritance with, with me? And uh, Jesus then talks about what's wrong with that and his worldview. And the place Jesus landed that teaching last week was in Luke twelve twenty one, which he said this, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In other words, nothing wrong with taking care of yourself, but to the exclusion of being rich toward God. And being rich toward God simply means, we said this, leveraging your life towards the things that God says matters most. So we're going to pick up there, all right? Because Jesus didn't quit teaching. And so this is like part B of, um, of last week. So Luke 12, 22, you can go to bcnow.church, you can find it there. We'll have it on the screen, or maybe you have your Bibles. When you, when you have it, when you're at Luke 12, 22, let's say, let's go. And he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious, there it is, about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Now, when Jesus uses that word anxious, anxious uh, meaning worry to the, degree, to the degree that it consumes your mind. Or let me put it this way. Don't be so worried about your life that your worry robs you of life. Uh, that, that's the dynamic that kind of plays out with worry. We get so concerned about life, we can't even enjoy the life that God's given us here on this earth. And one of the major problems with worry is this. If I worry about something enough, will that change the outcome of what I'm so worried about? Does it really change the way tomorrow looks? If I worry about this so much, God, I'm so worried about this. The answer to that is no. But what it does do is it robs us of the joy that we could be experiencing today as we do life side by side with others. Now, if you're someone who's continually worried, continually stressed, always anxious about so many different things in your life, God, will I ever get married? Is there a man? Is there a woman? Can we, are we going to have enough money to pay for this next month? I, my son, my daughter, they're kind of wayward and I'm just, I'm really stressed about it. It makes it so hard to do life side by side if you don't take that worry and do something with it. And good news today, Jesus tells us exactly what to do. We'll get to that in, in, in a few minutes. But I was thinking about this this week. I mean, how many days, maybe even months, have I lost with my family, my wife, my kids, by just letting worry rob me of the joy of today? I, it, being anxious about what may happen in the future to the extent that it just, it, it robs me and it robbed my family. And I was thinking, how many times have I been distant or maybe even been defeated because of something that might or might not happen the day after or the week after or the month after or the year after? Anybody else ever think things like this or just me? You're like, no, pastor, you're the only one that has that kind of time during the week to be able to do something like that. We need to stop paying you so much, you're thinking way too much. Here's what I'm talking about. Moms, dads, you're at the park. Your kids are playing. You're there, but you're not there. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you're physically there, but mentally, you're not there. The thing about worry is this. Worry is always about the future. It's always about tomorrow. And it robs us of what we could have today. Now, let me... How many of you are top A's in the room? Let's see your hands. Top A's? All right. I kind of let you off the hook a little bit. There's nothing wrong with planning for the future, okay? But there's a big difference in being wise and planning for the future than being anxious and worried about the future. I know you know that, but I just thought I'd better share that. And, you know, when things... Top A's, listen. When things don't go the way that you have planned, and you start to get really, really anxious, and sometimes you may even get angry. So you've got to be careful if we're top A's, what can happen. So again, the half-brother of Jesus here. If you have your Bible, slip over to James chapter 4. We'll come back to Luke, Luke in just a second, James 4. Jesus' half-brother, he gives us a, a, a better perspective on how to, how to look at our lives, a better way to look at tomorrow 
You ready? James 4, beginning in verse 13. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Hmm. That's true, isn't it? He's like, here's a question. What is your life? You ever thought about that? What is your life? For you are a mist. That appears for a little while or a little time, and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Have you ever thought about just how short our lives are here on this earth? I mean, I, I get to turn 38 this week, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm sorry. Gray hair just come early for me. Just don't worry about it. Right? Larry, did I get an amen back there? Are you? No? <laughs> what was I talking about? Dickie, you remember what I was talking about? Gray hair. Yeah, it's true. I was talking about gray hair. We were talking about life. I, I, I'm just kidding. And... <laughs> You know, I look back over my life, and I, I see so many things, but I, I can also see how fast. And I look up here, and I see Kobe playing the drums, and I'm going, where did that year go? Did I miss that one somewhere? You know, and with, with the kids, and those of you that are not married, you don't have kids, you're like, that, I, just, I just need to get married. I just, just want to have kids, you know. That's part of life. Anyway, so it, it, it's like life moves. And when you think about from eternity, from creation to when Jesus Christ returns, we're in here somewhere, all of us. There's Mike, there's Karen, there's Megan, Caleb. Where's Tyler? Here's where he stands. There's Tyler. <laughs> and there you are. Look, you're sitting all around. And I'm thinking, if we're here for just such a little while, what a blessing God has brought us to the United States of America to be able to live, to proclaim the gospel, and He loves us enough that He brought us to be a part of a local fellowship here where we can love one another and do life side by side. Why do we want to be so stressed out that we can't even do life together? We get so worried. I'm not saying that there's not some legitimate things to think about, plan about, get right. But if this was worry, if all your life is just a mist, just a vapor here for a little while, and then it's gone. If all of that is consumed with worry, anxiety, and stress, or let's just say that 80% of it is. Some of you are like, oh, you have no idea, Pastor Mike. My, my worry stress is not this, this. Mine is. See, some of you know someone in your life like that, don't you? And it makes it hard to come around them. And this is really woven throughout Scripture. You know, Proverbs says this in, in Proverbs 69. There's a thing about our ways and God's. It says, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. In other words, okay, Mike, go. Make some plans. There's nothing wrong with that. But make no mistake about it. God is the one who's going to make those things possible. Amen? He's always the one. So here's what we have to remember. When, when Jesus teaches us this, not to worry or be anxious, we should remember what his motives are. Jesus, okay, he knows we live in a fallen world, and he wants good for us in a fallen world. A good the way he means it. So he's, he's directing us not to lose today because we're so worried about tomorrow. In other words, make our, our plans and leave the rest in God's hands because he's got a better way. You can worry, you can stress all you want. But ultimately, listen, you're not going anywhere until God says it's time to go. You need to remember that. But... When we worry, ultimately, here's what we're doing. And I want you to hear this. Because I'm just as guilty of this as you may be. 
at times in my life. When we worry, ultimately what we're doing in a subtle way is we're playing God. We're playing God. I'm saying to God, God, I don't believe you. And I'm not really trusting that you're going to take care of me. So I've got to take care of my own self. I don't believe you will keep your promises and I don't believe you will do your job. So I've got to step into your role and I've got to do it for you, God. That's ultimately what I'm doing when I worry. And Jesus is saying, you don't have to live like that, Mike. I didn't create you, by the way, to handle that kind of pressure. Your shoulders are not big enough to carry all the stress, all the worry, and all the anxiety that this life is going to bring. Because when you do, nobody's really going to like to be around you. So Jesus says, your life is more than what you eat or what you wear. It's more than the material wants. So we don't want to put all of our mental energy, mental strength into worrying about these things. Now he gives us an object lesson. You ready? Back to Luke uh, 12. Look over Luke 12, verse 24. Consider the ravens. He's like, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Oh, how much more value are you than the birds? Remember, Jesus did most of his teaching outdoors, and he's like, right in the middle of this probably, he's like, look, see those birds over there? See those ravens? As he's teaching, he's like, they're not anxious. They're not like pacing around in fear, wondering about this or that. And then he's like, he looks back at them. He says, you're so much more valuable than they are. I just want to remind you of that today. That's what Jesus would say to you. But here's the verse I think that will kind of hit you in verse 25. He says this. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? There's an hour I'm going to put in my pocket. Do I really have it? Absolutely not. So if my thought process is that, that I, I'm going to be able, if, if I can just worry, I'm going to add to my lifespan. I would say, is, is that really working for anybody? I don't think so. Does our lives ever get any longer because we stress or worry or, or anxious? No. Maybe shorten them, right? And this just cuts right through that illusion of control and worry. It's based on, you know, no, it, it, f folks, nobody ever benefits from it. Uh, and most of us, if anything, are going to have like these negative ramifications from it. It's not going to add to our life. It's going to ultimately rob from our life. And it's going to bring medical issues that are rooted so deeply in worry and anxiety. And, and worry is very close, very closely related to this word uh, fear. And uh, in other words, fear of tomorrow robs us of joy today. Uh, which is probably why there is this command all throughout scriptures that says what? Fear not. Fear not. In other words, don't be afraid. We see that look all throughout the scriptures. So worry doesn't help us, it only hurts us. But here's the thing, I know we're flawed human beings and we tend to worry um, so much about different things. Probably why First Peter, uh, or Peter said this in First Peter 5, 6 and 7, always been such a big help to me. He said this, humble yourselves. We could t we just stop there and talk about that the rest of the message, but we won't. Humble yourselves, therefore, how? Under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him that I put in there. Well, why? He says, because he cares for you. Now, let me paraphrase that just a little. We go like this. Could we all just stop playing God and trust that God is strong enough to take care of us better than we could ever take care of ourselves? And in the meantime, why don't we just tell Him what we're worried about? You ever thought about that? <laughs> Some people get silent when they get worried. I've done that before. Some people get silent with God. You know, you'd be stressed out or worried about something and never take it to God, never go, never go to God and, and pray. Because he cares for you, why not take it to God? Why be silent with it? So God's like, hey, you need to cast it onto my shoulders. 
because he cares for me. He's with me. He's walking with me. He's, he's with you. He's walking with you. Whatever you may be going, whatever stress, whatever's going on in your life, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your finances, whether it is your, your relationship with God. Maybe you're stressed out today because you know you've been coming here for a while. And every time you come here, not anything I say, but from the Word of God, something in, in, is, is connecting with you. And, and, and God's going, you, you need to get things right. So Jesus keeps going. Remember, he's outside. Another object lesson, you ready? Verse 26. If then you are not able to do as small a thing as, in other words, add to your life, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies. There you go. How they grow. I mean, they neither toll nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Well, but if God so clothes the grass... Wow. Which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. How much more will he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. And do not seek. You want to, if I were you, I would underline or circle that word in your Bible. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek, there it is again, after these things. And your Father knows that you need them. That's, this word seek here. It's really important because it's actually a negative word. Uh, this is a word that is used to describe a certain worldview, a way of living, a way of ordering your life that's representative, probably by way of many of us, maybe most of us spend our time. The word seek is very closely related to this word. You ready? Lust. Which means this, to have your affections directed towards something, to long after something, to desire something with all of your heart. You know, I think most of life's battles are about good affections gone bad. And we overvalue good things at the expense of the best things. In other words, the thing that God says is right and good and true and good for us, right? So, nothing wrong with desiring food. Nothing's wrong with desiring water or clothing or protection. God created us with a need for those things. And He is aware of the fact that we need them. But... When our entire lives become ordered around us taking care of ourselves and nothing else or no one else, in other words, lusting after stuff, money, clothes, homes, whatever that may be, it prevents me, i found in my life, from two things. The first thing it prevents me from is faith. The kind of faith that God wants me to have. It's believing and ordering my life in such a way as to demonstrate that I believe God is who He says He is and He will keep all of His promises and I can trust that God will ultimately take care of me. So when I order my entire life around only, listen, only taking care of myself, that says something. That says I'm trying to take the place of God in my life. Now it also says I don't have faith in God. As a matter of fact, God... Uh, I've got faith in me to do it, not you. It also prevents me from this, taking care of others. You see, when my whole life is about satisfying my needs, my wants, my desires, and nothing else, by definition, that restricts me from being able to take care of other people. And getting to take care of other people side by side is actually a better way to do life in the way that God created us to When I truly believe God will take care of me, it frees me up to be an instrument God uses to take care of others. See, it creates this freedom to be able to reach out and to be generous and not to be someone all the time worried over everything that has to do with Mike. But it enables me to see the needs of other people to see how God may have blessed me, myself, Karen, our family in a way that we could help meet that need, help provide food, help provide finances, help to do this, whatever that may look like. But when my focus is, hmm, I can't do it. Maybe you can. I can't. So the question then is, what if you got that thing that you ordered your entire life after. The question then would be, well, did that satisfy you? Or would that satisfy you? 
Then the question will be, well, for how long did that satisfy you, if at all? Whatever this might be, it's, listen, it's not capable of meeting or satisfying your deepest heart's long. And if I, if we try to get from this what I can only get from God, I'm going to tell you over and over and over and over again, we get frustrated. Now, listen, if your marriage is frustrated right now, there's a good chance that you're trying to get from your spouse what you can only get, what God only intended you to get from Him. Your spouse is not your enemy. Okay? Jesus doesn't just identify what doesn't work, but he also points us to something better. He's like, it's a better way to do life. Verse 31, you ready? He said, instead, seek. There's that word again. Here's my question. Is that the same word? All right, let's, let's read and then we'll talk about it. It said, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. That seek word, word there, it is the same in the English language, but in the Greek, there are actually two different words. This is not the same seek that was in the connotation of lusting after something. This seek simply means this. You ready? Searching. Searching. Meaning, make this the lead pursuit of my life. I'm going to fix my mind. I'm give my attention to something. And Jesus says that's his kingdom. God's kingdom is God's people in God's place living under his rule and blessing. Meaning to actively put yourself under the authority of God. God, you're, you're God. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to say that out loud today. In my heart, here, here it comes. And I trust God that you have good for me. You want good for me. That you fully love us as your children. So actively seek to order your life toward the things that Jesus says are best. And Jesus says this. Do that. And what does he say? And these things will be added to you. Y'all see that? They're talking about this. All the things you're so worried about and concerned about. The food, the clothes, the money. God knows you need those things. And he's like, I'll add those to you. You be obedient in this area. You, you don't worry. You don't stress. I'll take care of those things. You see, God... God is not a God who desires to deprive us of something. That's not his agenda. He, God's not trying to destroy you. You know, the truth of the scripture is that he's begun a good work in you. And he's going to be faithful. And he's going to complete that good work that he started in you. Can somebody say amen? I believe that too. That's in the Bible. So he's not going to leave us and he's not going to forsake us. He's not going to abandon us. And he promises to walk beside us. And I think for me, sometimes in my life, my journey, if I have ever started to question anything like this, God has always taken me and said, Mike, come let me show you something. I want you to remember something. You remember what my son Jesus did on the cross? If he's willing to, to do that, to die on the cross for you, do you think he's not going to take care of you? Verse 32 goes on, Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In other words, what God gives us He's not in heaven going, ah, I hate to let this go. He's not half-heartedly giving this. He gives out of the overflow of a generous heart because he loves his children and he loves you today. So our lives are lived out of what we believe God's intentions are toward us, folks. I believe this. And being in ministry for so many years, if I ever get a chance to sit down with some, somebody and they're just completely consumed and look like they have no hope, no faith, I'm always asking this question. I'm trying to get to the bottom of this. What do you believe God's intentions are for you? And here's what I wrote down. If you believe, if you believe God's out to get you, that's going to be your paradigm every single time. If you believe God loves you, and then that's going to be your life's paradigm. 
You ever wondered why in God we trust his own money? We, we say all the time, well, I trust in God. I think one of the reasons is every time we let go of money or we take hold of that, we can remember, I trust in something far bigger than this $20 bill or this $5 bill or this $100 bill or this $1 bill. And I think it's a reminder to us that that's the biggest competitor for our hearts. You say, no, 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 Pastor. In God, I trust. The question then is, could we find evidence in our lives that we trust in God in those areas? Here's a question. Am I risking anything in any part of my life for what God says matters most? Which is what, again, His name and His people. Because here's the reality. Where there is no risk, there is no trust. That's just true. So, where in our lives are we seeking His kingdom to such a degree that if He doesn't show up and do what He promised to do, we're done. It's finished. It's over, right? God, either you show up or, or we're done. Where do we have anything on the line to the degree that if God doesn't do what He promised He would do, we're, we're going to be in trouble? Is there any part in our financial lives where we're demonstrating that we trust God? If not, the question is, why? Well, Mike, you don't understand. There's no way we could give We're in debt so bad, it's, it's, it's crazy. Okay, I get that. But my question after that is going to be this. If you come and see me, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Are you willing to go see a financial advisor? What's the plan that you have moving forward? You know, worrying about your finances doesn't change anything about your finances. It only changes us. So my instruction to you would be, my thoughts to you would, would be this. So we're talking about side by side. You got some financial issues? Okay, we've all probably been there. All right? Maybe worse than you have right now, or maybe not as bad as you have right now. I, I have no idea. Okay? But... There are people in this room who have been down that journey and have made some wise choices and turned that around. And they would be more than willing to go hang out with you and sit down and listen to where you're at. And to pray with you and to think with you. And to do life side by side. But you've got to remember this, okay? Don't do that. Proverbs 27, 6, Right? Words from a friend can be trusted. An enemy multiplies what? Kisses. So if you're going to go, if you're going to talk to someone, you're going to, you're, going to, you're going to say, hey, here's what's going on. You need to be willing to listen. If they say, you need to get rid of the cable. No more new cars. Stop going out to eat so much. It's probably going to be one of the best things you can do. So if we want something different, some things need to change, and it's going to require something of us that probably none of us in this room like. You ready? Sacrifice. Some of you are like, guess what? I went to church this morning. It's almost Easter. And the pastor said I needed to be willing to make some sacrifices. I mean, we like, I would love to have financial freedom without any sacrifice. <laughs> well, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm Powerball. <laughs> the lottery there you go right hey I've got just enough money to make honey let's go to Vegas I think we can just we can so settle this it's a, the answer to all of our financial troubles I think it's always good for us to remember you ready God doesn't need our money okay in a few minutes when some of our teenagers pass the offering basket around this room. God is not sitting in heaven this morning going, I just hope that they put enough in. I, 
I don't know what I'm going to do. If they don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. No. You know what God does want? He wants your heart. He wants your heart. Because he knows if he has your heart, he has every part of you. And some of you are like, God has my heart. God has every part of me, but where my treasure is. And God knows that letting go of money is good for us, which is why Jesus said this in verse 33. He said, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. In other words, we are to direct our resources toward the things that make eternal difference, demonstrating what we think about God with our resources and finances so that we can be open-handed with our money is really, really good thing for our hearts. So let's stop worrying about money. Second Corinthians 8 9 says this, for, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Now, he's not talking about financial wealth here. He's talking about spiritual wealth. So we're rich in Jesus Christ today according to this passage. In Philippians 2, 4 through 7 says this, Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others, having this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in, in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So Jesus has gone first and and he lands this entire teaching in Luke 12 with this very famous story. We've been going through this Luke 12 for now for several weeks. And here's, he's landing right here, verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's just a true fact. You say treasure, that whatever you're seeking. In other words, what you've aligned your life with. And the question is this, is that what God says is most important? His name and his people. Let's pray.